Ryan Stanton here with ASEP Frontline, joined today by Dr. Casey Bryant, um, an, a fellow uh, Southeasterner in uh, North Carolina at Wake Forest. Um, actually works with a good friend of mine. And, and so uh, what we're talking about today, an interesting topic, because as everybody knows, we are in a pandemic. If you don't know, um, then you may just, I don't know, just may want to come out from under that rock. Well, actually, I'd, I'd say just stay there for, for another six months or so. But um, is the, the ventilation and the management of airways in our COVID patients. And one of the technologies, we've talked about it before here on the podcast, but there's been some interesting uh, transition um, research data evidence that has come out regarding COVID-19 with high flow, um, high flow nasal cannula, high flow ventilations, and those types of technologies. And of course, there was always at the beginning of the pandemic and even throughout has been a lot of concern about these non-controlled airway-based ventilation methods. So staying away from NEB, staying away from high flows, staying away from uh, BiPAP, CPAP, whatever it may be. But the evidence isn't supporting the choices that we have made so far. And so we're going to talk about a lot of those with Dr. Bryant. And um, we're going to start off by just uh, asking about where we were before COVID, uh, talk about the technology, how does it work, why does it work, and the data that supported it before we got to the pandemic. Sure. Thanks for, thanks for having me, Ryan. Um, so I think with any technology, um, when you're talking about using something for your patient, you really need to understand what it's doing uh, to and for your patient. Um, and with, with high flow, um, it brings a number of, of advantages uh, to your patient um, with you know, some, some form of respiratory failure. Um, these high flows, and as you increase flows, it, it kind of washes out your dead space. Um, so it decreases the work that the patient has to do um, to ventilate and to, and to oxygenate. So, and as you increase those flows, the amount of dead space washout that occurs uh, increases as well. Um, and that kind of promotes improved gas exchange. Um, Additionally, with these increased flows, uh, you get uh, increased kind of mean airway pressures, um, and they've you know measured this on tracheostomy patients, you know, down in the in the airway, and you get somewhere on the magnitude of of three to four, maybe even five of PEEP um, uh, with with these increased and higher flows when you get to you know 50 and 60 liters a minute, um, and that can you know certainly um, contribute to maybe some alveolar recruitment and and maintenance of that recruitment. Um, and improve gas exchange in that in that realm. Um, with the patient, uh, if they if they do have their mouth open, that may contribute a little bit to to decreasing that um, that added advantage. But um, there's some some measure of of increase in in airway pressure that's uh, afforded to your patient, which which helps them with um, you know, meeting their um, ventilatory and, and oxygenation needs. Additionally, the, the humidity uh, plays a pretty uh, significant role in the benefits that it delivers to your patient. Um, that humidity kind of continues to promote improved uh, mucociliary function, um, whereas if, if that humidity is not there and it's not at 100%, then those um, cilia can start to, to dry out and, and become dysfunctional. So it kind of helps with secretion clearance and things like that. So it brings a, a, a number of added benefits, which collectively um, when you add high flow to your patient that's that's struggling to breathe, you'll see um, that their worker breathing will decrease. They'll look more comfortable. Um, they'll be able to take kind of slower, deeper breaths. Um, and, and overall, you'll help meet their their needs at that time. So those are kind of the basics of of high flow and the physiology behind it and um, you know how it how it brings benefit to your patient. And I talk to when I when I've done education on airway management in the past, you know, people forget that between the alveoli and the edge of your nose and mouth is that dead space that we're basically our own little physiologic recycling program, um, where you when you exhale, you have that certain amount, typically 50 to 100 cc's or so, that then is the first aspect of the inhalation as well. And so this does wash out a lot of that. And you're absolutely correct that um the humidification is the key to the technology in that if you try even doing, you know, 10 uh, uh, with with just the dry oxygen, um, it gets pretty painful pretty quickly. But looking mm -hmm. at 20, 40, 60 uh, or more uh, of volume with humidification, it makes all the difference in the world uh, in how it feels, the comfort level, 
and of course the benefit there. So um, what was the evidence supporting this in, in populations uh, prior to March when we started getting significant COVID cases within the United States? So I think previously um, there are two, two major studies that we can kind of look at. One was the florality trial and the other was a meta-analysis of 18 trials that was put out in chess. Um, so the, the florality, florality trial um, was kind of the landmark study back in 2015, it was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And um, they looked at just over 300 patients were including folks with a P to F ratio less than 300. And they were randomizing them to high flow versus a, a face mask versus a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And their primary outcome, which they did not see a statistical significance for was um, rates of intubation. There was a trend that favored high flow, but it did not reach uh, statistical significance because uh, they actually weren't intubating as many patients as they thought they were in that study. But they did show or, or did see on some secondary analysis that they did that uh, in folks that were sicker with PDFs less than 200, there was a trend of statistical significance um, in intubation rates in that group. And there was also a, a, a pretty important patient-centered outcome, uh, in my opinion. It was a secondary outcome, but um, looking at mortality, there was a favorable p-value for ICU and 90-day mortality uh, in that study. In addition, kind of going back to comfort, um, the patients that were on high flow reported more comfort than the other patients, and they also had more ventilator-free days, uh, which I feel like more days alive without a ventilator is pretty comfortable too. Um, so there was a lot of signals in that study, and it was a well-done study um, showing benefit for uh, high flow. Um, and then kind of transitioning to that uh, chest meta-analysis that was uh, published back in 2017. And they looked at 18 different trials using high flow and comparing it to other different modalities of, of non-invasive oxygen delivery. There was a trend um, favoring a high flow um, over both non-invasive and conventional oxygen therapy for intubation rates. In addition, there was a trend, trend for mortality. Um, collectively, those trends did not completely meet st statistical significance, but um, I think when you're talking about high flow being a part of your armamentarium, this certainly supports that uh, and it's appropriate device to be using for the patients. It's certainly not harming the patients over other uh, modes of, of support. And um, there, there seems to be some favorable trends out there that would suggest that maybe it's a little bit better than some of the other modes. So we were cruising along happy as clams, spraying oxygen and humidity all over the place uh, up until March and then COVID hits. And with COVID, um, you know, we, we all of a sudden there's only two options. There's either, you know, nothing up to about two liters nasal cannula or intubation. Anything else was considered um, turning the patient into the typhoid Mary of COVID um, and spreading it all over the place through uh, droplets, dispersion, and, and, and the pressures associated with it potentially making everybody sick. And so we pulled away, uh, and, and we're still seeing a lot of those ripple effects, especially with, uh, especially with uh, uh, nebulizers and things like that, um, that there's still a fear of, of possible spread of COVID because of the interventions that we're doing. So let's look at that. In terms of high flow technology, what is the research that is coming out with regard to the concerns that we saw going into COVID and potential functional, uh, functional use and utility within the COVID patient population? Yeah, you're 100% correct. There was a, a definitely a fear that if you had any type of, of flow at all being delivered to the patient that wasn't going through an endotracheal tube, then you were you know, putting your entire staff at risk, including yourself. Um, and I recall those days where, you know, someone would be on six liters and I'd be working in the ER and they would be asking me to intubate that patient and, and trying to resist that and, and have discussions um, and, and advocate on the patient's behalf. And if you look at, you know, some of the data that came out early uh, in the New York area, um, you know, they were intubating folks. I think they're positive pressure ventilation, non-invasive um, positive pressure use, and then uh, high flow use early on was, you know, each of those was less than 5% when they were kind of initially being overrun there. Um, and then when they looked at their data, their mortality rates were, were very high, much higher than expected uh, for the folks that went on the ventilator. And um, they kind of adjusted their strategy accordingly. Um, and 
you know, Washington and New York were kind of hit hard before the rest of us. So we, we got to learn some from their experience uh, in regards to this, this, you know, belief that we needed to, to move towards early intubation. Um, and, and you're right. I think, you know, when you look at high flow, um, the, the, the two primary areas of concern would be droplet generation and then delaying an, an appropriate intubation. Um, we can certainly talk about, you know, both of those areas. Looking at, at droplets, you know, I think it's important to understand droplets themselves uh, to begin with. Um, there's different modes of transmission. There's contact transmission, uh, there's droplet transmission, and then there's um, airborne transmission. So the airborne is, is you know, kind of generated by these tiny droplets that are less than five micrometers. And then your droplet transmission is more your medium-sized um, droplets. And they're you know, at this point, I believe to probably be the primary drivers of, of spread of, of COVID. And then you have your, your contact uh, transmission, which is going to come primarily from these large droplets. Um, and the droplets themselves, you know, they, they have a lifespan, right? And there's a couple of things that contribute to that, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, the size of the droplet, um, you know, the larger droplets are going to evaporate more slowly, um, whereas these tiny um, airborne type droplets are going to stick around uh, for a very short period of time. And then you also have the aspect of, of settling, where how quickly does the, the droplet settle out of the air down to the surface? Um, and those are two of the kind of primary components about droplets that, that determine their lifespan. Um, again, these medium-sized droplets seem to be the ones that are driving disease because they can kind of hang around the air longer. In addition, they can carry a, a little bit larger viral load than the uh, than these airborne droplets um, that are pretty tiny and, and can evaporate pretty quickly. And then there are environmental aspects to, to the droplet lifespan as well, right? So the humidity in the room, the heat in the environment, uh, air exchange, um, and then how the droplets generate it, right? If you are generating more droplets, then that's going to contribute to potential exposure to, to other people that are trying to take care of the patient. With the droplets i mean and what you're talking about here from my, my standpoint in my mind you know i'm thinking spit spittle and in breath in terms of the ways these things are, are spreading but the thought is that with the high flow technology that we are blowing just this huge balloon of air um, and thus um, aerosolization uh, of potential covid throughout the room What's the data showing on the reality of that dispersion um, when it versus regular breathing versus, you know, a little bit of nasal cannula versus uh, the high flow technology? Yeah, so there's a number of, of studies that, you know, because there's a lot of interest in this area. So there are a number of, of studies in the, in the literature that we can kind of look to to give us an idea um, of what type of risk uh, there is uh, that's associated with these droplets. Um, so the, the first one um, that I'd like to kind of highlight would be a study that was published earlier this year in the proceedings of uh, the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and I'm going to butcher this name, but it was uh, Stednitsky, uh, I believe, um, and, and their colleagues. And basically they had someone speaking into a box and saying, repeating phrases uh, for a minute, and then they would look at the droplet generation using a laser and actually an iPhone. And through their calculations that, that with the droplet generation, um, they were able to estimate that if you had 7 million viral copies as your kind of oral load for the patient, then speaking for a minute into this box um, would generate about a thousand uh, viral particles that would remain airborne for eight minutes. Now, this box was kind of stagnant. Um, so this is not you know, taking place in a room, a negative pressure room with air exchanges, but it gives us some idea of, of droplet generation just with regular talking. You know, next there was a study that was published in the aerosol science and technology uh, earlier this year uh, by Ausvid and their group. And they were looking at much smaller droplets using an aerodynamic particle sizer. And um, this is looking at droplets that were kind of less than 10 micrometers. And, and they were primarily looking at droplet generation as you kind of move from normal speaking to loud speaking to singing to loud singing. And it increased kind of linearly, linearly throughout. Um, and the interesting thing for me was that when, it, when I put a mask on, the even the loud singing went all the way back down to 
kind of the equivalent droplet uh, generation into the atmosphere um, of someone that was just you know normally talking. So it just showed efficacy of these masks, even for these really really tiny uh, droplets. And it also showed me that you know imagine you know, get you're sitting in a stagnant um, bar across from your buddy, and you're having a beer. And as you as you have beers, you talk louder, and these droplets kind of hang around the air um, for eight ten minutes and the louder you talk, the more droplets you you emit. You know you can certainly transmit disease that way. Um, one of the more interesting uh, studies was by Huey et al. Um, and he uh, published that in the European Respiratory Journal. That was actually back in 2019. Um, and his model was really interesting because they or they put um, kind of intrapulmonary smoke for their simulation model, and they had a model that could simulate different air or different severities of airway disease um, and they were comparing or comparing facial kind of oral oral nasal uh, CPAP versus a nasal pillow CPAP um, and then comparing it to high flow as well um, and they were looking for dispersion rates of this smoke using laser technology and um, in the CPAP group uh, that dispersion um, only got up to, to 30 centimeters even at 20 centimeters of of PEEP, um, so you're only seeing these particles, smoke particles, um, 30 centimeters away from the face, which isn't very far. Um, and this is in a, a simulated model that's able to take tidal breaths and things like that. Um, and then with high flow, even at the highest rates, uh, you only saw dispersion not to 17 centimeters. Um, so again, you know, very, very low levels of dispersion away from the, the simulator. Um, they did note that when the high flow connection was loose, that that dispersion increased out to 60, uh, 62 centimeters, which still, you know, is pretty close to the patient. Um, so I think it, you know, that that study, they did a nice job of kind of highlighting that these droplets aren't kind of spraying all over the room, but they are, they are, you know, getting into the air. And I think it just underscores that you need to take full PPE uh, precautions when you go into these rooms, period, um, regardless of what mode um, of support they're on. The list of studies kind of goes on. Um, there was a recent one that was published in CHESS by Leonard and, and their colleagues, and they also used a simulator mannequin. This one was more looking at high velocity um, nasal cannula, the, you know, the vapotherm uh, technology. And the take home from that study, um, they again used a simulator model and, and it, this um, uh, model was taking tidal volume breaths. And uh, the take home for me was that the 40 liters and the six liters, there was actually more droplet uh, caught in the mask because um, they were comparing masked and non-masked um, simulations. And the droplets that were caught in the mask were actually increased when you were on a higher flow than than they were when you were just on six liters nasal cannula. Um, with that said, uh, the droplets that did escape the mask traveled a further distance. I think it was close to 16% of those uh, droplets went greater than a meter. Um, so it may actually you know, increase the amount of droplets that get caught in the mask, but the ones that escape may be smaller ones and they may travel further. Uh, I think there you know, certainly some unknowns, but it seemed that the mask made a, a very large difference um, you know, in, in containing those droplets, um, which is important for the clinicians because I think that when these folks are on these different types of um, non-invasive therapies, whether it's nasal cannula or high flow cannula, um, that they should be wearing a mask at that time. And we need to educate them uh, on that fact. Um, the, I think the last study I'd like to, to highlight is, is one that was in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia by uh, Lowe and, and his colleagues and they had five healthy volunteers that they got to gargle blue and red colored water. And then they had high flow nasal cannula, um, the OptiFlow device on, and, and they uh, were flowing at 60 liters and they asked them to cough and uh, measured how far the cough would go. Um, and even without any type of, of uh, oxygen support, um, they were still able to cough about uh, two and a half meters, um, which is further than your kind of, you know, safe exclusion zone. And with the high flow in place, uh, that increased to, to 2.9 meters as far as the mean goes. So just shows that, you know, even without something on, if someone coughs um, when you're in their room, 
um, you know, that, that cough would wind up on your face if you're not adequately uh, protected. So I think, you know, all of those studies show that, um, that there's going to be a generation, that there's not one thing that just, you know, uh, exponentially increases the number of droplets that you're going to be exposed to. Um, and that I think you just need to protect yourself, uh, number one. Number two, I think we need to educate the patients. They need to know that you need to wear your mask and you need to wear it all the time. You don't need to just wear it when you see me coming in the room because if you're in the room, you're talking on your phone or you're coughing, or you're doing those types of things, you're filling that room with, with droplets at that point. Um, even if there's a negative pressure air exchange, you're still gonna increase the number of droplets that are in the room. And you need to help me help you and help others by protecting me. Um, and I think that having that conversation with patients early on and, and letting them know that you expect them to wear a mask more or less at all times, unless they're eating or you know doing some other type of oral care or something like that. And again, I, I think that taken as a whole, they're going to be droplets. And um, as long as we protect ourselves, educate our patients, I think you should do what you think is, is the right mode of support for your patient. Um, and not operate completely out of fear. I mean, the moral of the story is it sounds like it it does increase slightly, but it's not a huge, I mean, it doesn't turn turn the patient's room into a nuclear meltdown situation uh, of potential badness. I mean, it's a slight increase, but not a huge amount of increase, especially with the role that it potentially plays in what we're going to talk about next. And, you know, one of the things, there's a couple of points with where we are currently in the COVID uh, pandemic. And we do know that we want to avoid intubation as much as possible, uh, the mechanical ventilation as much as possible with COVID, because we do know that the, um, uh, the mortality, morbidity, mortality does go up um, when somebody is intubated. Now, whether that is just a, a characteristic of the severity of the disease, but we're trying to pull away from intubation, but also the fact that we are at a point now uh, in many areas where it may not be an option. We may not have enough ventilators to go around for every single person. And so we may push a little bit further to try to prevent that um, intubation rate, uh, as opposed to what we talked about earlier with the beginning of the pandemic, where we intubated people really early. Um, now understanding the mechanism of COVID, that the happy hypoxic, uh, most folks can swim along at, at what lower than what we would expect typical oxygen saturations and be relatively fine. And, and instead of intubating somebody when they reach that 82, 85 point, um, you know, we may be watching somebody or doing just some supplemental oxygen therapy and and just continuing to watch. But there's actually been a lot of studies. And interestingly, I, I, I didn't realize how much research had come out with regard to high flow nasal cannula with regard to COVID. And, you know, while you're talking, I just pulled up the list on the on the old Google machine. And I mean, it was just page after page of different research uh, articles. But some of the most interesting that I'm seeing have to do with the use of the high flow nasal cannula and high flow devices within the critical care setting in an effort to decrease the intubation rate. And, you know, at least the one I've got pulled up right now by Alexander, it's a Daboul, Dumoulet, or I don't know if you're listening, you can call me and let me know. Um, but uh, it, it's one that high flow nasal cannula and critical, air pa critical care patients, critically ill patients with severe COVID-19, showing decreased numbers of intubations with, um, with high flow nasal cannula, but also then potentially, um, though it overall didn't change the mortality rate, it did keep more people off of the vent. So l looking at where we are with COVID-19, what is that role for high, high flow nasal cannula in terms of stewardship of our limited supplies of ventilators and keeping people from being intubated altogether. Yeah, that's an interesting study. And um, I agree with you that you do have to be a, a good steward of all of your resources. Um, and as it appears that we're on the brink of kind of being overrun yet again, um, you're, you're going to have to use each resource um, appropriately and in, in, in the most effective manner possible. Um, certainly, there's there's you know older evidence that that you can help avoid uh, intubation uh, with high flow, um, which I think is a, a pretty uh, patient centered outcome, um, and um, and again avoid that resource um, that that is dedicated to to someone being on the, the, the ventilator and, and all the things that go along with it, ventilator lung injury, uh, muscle wasting, uh, additional delirium uh, contributions. I mean, the list goes on about 
you know, how, how uh, being on the ventilator um, can neg negatively kind of impact the patient overall um, and uh, avoiding that if possible, I think is important, um, both from a resource standpoint, but also um, from a patient center standpoint. Um, when, when you talk about having someone on high flow and you're using this kind of ventilator avoidance strategy, um, it's important to kind of um, make sure that you don't get so locked into avoiding the ventilator that, that you avoid intubating your patient appropriately. Um, and there's some, some really good uh, literature out there regarding an index that we can use to help kind of avoiding, avoid that delayed intubation. Um, there's a number of retrospective studies um, previously that showed that you know, intubations late, which was, is commonly uh, defined as more than 48 hours uh, on some sort of therapy before you intubate, is associated with somewhere between 10 to 20 percent increase in mortality. Uh, these are retrospective studies primarily, so the, you know, the reasons for that, um, you know, there are going to be many, but certainly you have to believe if you um, leave your patient on this mode of therapy and they're getting to the point where they're about to crash and fall off the cliff, and then you say, now it's time to intubate, you know, one, that intubation is going to be more challenging and more physiologically difficult because of um, the, the, the physiologic state that they're in at that point. And two, uh, I know we've all seen it, you know, you, you, you take over that patient's airway and then afterwards, hours afterwards, however long, you know, they just, they kind of decompensate completely throughout their, their, their whole body, kind of multi-organ uh, failure and, and whatnot. So kind of trying to avoid waiting until you get to that, that point is important. Um, and there was a, a study um, that uh, was done by uh, Roca uh, out of Spain and France, and, and they developed this ROCKS index, um, which we use in the ICU a lot to assess whether or not the patient's kind of flying uh, on high flow and whether it's appropriate to continue. And they have a cutoff of 4.88, and that was um, you know, developed in the derivation study, and, th and then that same group uh, validated their, their um, index with a, a second group of 190 patients. Um, and that cutoff of 4.88 um, was maintained. Um, and you're gonna get at 12 hours, this ROCKS index, which is you know, pretty easy things to, to calculate. So you have your, your oxygen saturation to your, your delivered FiO2 ratio. So that percentage divided by the respiratory rate. So if you have someone that's on, um, has a SAT of 90%, so 0.9 divided by they're delivered uh, FiO2, so if it's 0.9 by uh, 0.9, then you would multiply that by 100 and then divide it by whatever respiratory rate they have. Um, two, two components to that, I think you need to make sure that your SpO2 waveform is accurate um, that you're going to base your calculation off of. And I also think you need to make sure that your respiratory rate uh, that you're using is accurate. Um, so you're going to have to go physically watch your patient breathe. We've all seeing the monitors uh, say apnea while the patient's breathing 45 times a minute. So you're gonna have to go, you're gonna have to stand at the patient's room and, and count their breaths and look at their waveform and make sure they have a good SpO2 waveform on the monitor. And then you can make this calculation. Um, and at 12 hours, if your index is greater than 4.88 and right, so respiratory rate is in the denominator. So that's gonna be inversely proportional to success. Um, and your SpO2 to FiO2 ratio is on the numerator, so that's going to be directly proportional to success, right? So you want a higher index. Um, if you're greater than 4.88 uh, in the derivation study, that was 89% positively predictive of high flow success and, and intubation avoidance. And uh, in the validation study that they did, uh, it was kind of in the mid 80s uh, percentile uh, predictive of success. Um, now that's kind of 12 hours. I hope that you know, listeners uh, in the emergency medicine world are not sitting on patients for 12 hours in their ER, but uh, it's a brave new world out there. So we're all doing the best we can. I'm sure that there are some, some folks that are getting put in those situations or will be put in those situations in the near future. Um, something that we can use kind of on a shorter time frame is um, doing these calculations earlier. So they also in the, in the uh, validation study had a two, a six and a, and a 12 hour mark where they were trying to develop a cutoff that was predictive of failure as opposed to predictive of success. And uh, at the two hour mark, if you're less than 2.85 2.85 on your rocks index, then uh, that was 99% uh, specific for uh, need for intubation. 
Um, so again, a, a low ROX index is, is bad. And then at six, six hours, less than 3.47 um, was 99% uh, predictive of, of failure. And to go back to uh, just uh, droplet generation and, and titrating these therapies and, and things like that, um, you know, for me, I, I tend to start off at kind of 40 to 50 liters of flow and titrate it to the patient's comfort. So you put them on this therapy, they should look more comfortable. Their respiratory rate should start coming down. Um, and then kind of titrating your, your FIA2 kind of to the mid 90s range, um, if possible. And and then it's just, just kind of assessing your patient. And once you, you've titrated that therapy and you feel like you've gotten your patient to a good place and they look better, um, then you can switch to this mode of ongoing monitoring and um, assessing this ROX index to, to give you a, a, an objective um, measure of, of whether you should, you know, kind of reevaluate your strategy, all trying to avoid getting yourself into that position where you're intubating a patient that is, is right at the edge of the cliff. Um, and now you have to give the medicine um, to relax them and, and, and paralyze them and put a, a breathing tube in and change their, um, you know, intrathoracic physiology drastically at the same time when they were kind of hanging on the edge of that cliff. So um, this is certainly something I think that, that uh, listeners uh, in the emergency medicine world, if they're not aware of it, is something that, that they can use, um, especially when you're dealing with boarding situations and stuff like that. The ROC score is spelled R-O-X. Um... And uh, interestingly, emergency physician, uh, one of our California emergency physicians, Dr. Graham Walker, was the contributor uh, for the MD Calc side of it. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because while, while you're talking about it, I plugged in a couple of numbers and I have my patient with an 80% SpO2, 50% FiO2, breathing 30 times a minute. And that gives me a 5.33 points uh, on the ROCS index with a low risk of progression to intubation. And that's that would make me a little bit nervous, but, uh, you know, I like the fact that there's actually the supportive data and, and what this one actually does is, um, if you like me don't have in your stuck in your mind, the relative FIO twos of oxygen delivery devices, uh, it, the, the bottom of the, uh, of this particular calculator actually has it worked out for you in terms of nasal cannulas, simple face mask, non rebreather mask and high flow nasal cannula devices. So, um, you know, you can, you can go on there for a nice little, uh, cheat sheet. Now, one of the things um, as we get closer to the end here, one of the things that's become pretty popular uh, has been the prone positioning of our patients. And um, as, as something that improves morbidity and mortality, and a lot of people are self-proning. Um, I've even seen, you know, lay public who've seen, who've seen stuff who, when they get COVID, they start proning at home. Um, and, you know, other than the physical challenges of that in general, where it sounds like we just need to have an overabundance of those massage beds so people can actually have that open face area underneath the bed. Um, there's actually some research that's come out on the high flow nasal cannula with regard to in high flow devices with regard to the prone uh, positioning in non-ventilated COVID patients. It's called the position study. Tell us about that. Sure. And it, it just for one second, just to kind of go back to that delivered FiO2, um, again, this is something where you have to really, um, you know, look at your patient, as I know you're aware. And, um, you know, if you have them on kind of lower support devices and they have a high minute ventilation, you know, 40, 50 liters, whatever it is, um, and you've got them on a non rebreather at, at 15 or 20 liters, right? They're in training a lot of, of room air. So that delivered FiO2. Um, may not be, um, you know, quite what you would expect it to be. But I think when you have them on these um, either positive pressure uh, ventilator masks or or the high flow mask, you're meeting their metabolic needs. And that's why you see the the respiratory rate and things like that come down and the patient look more comfortable. So I think you can feel pretty good that the, the FIO2 that you're getting to or that you're trying to deliver is actually what you're delivering to the patient and not, you know, in training a bunch of, of room air and, and kind of diluting that out. Um, as far as the uh, awake proning, um, you know, the majority of the data that had come out before the position study was a lot of case series kind of uh, observational stuff saying, you know, I, I had my patient prone and their SATs got better and we avoided the ventilator. And, and you know, it certainly proved a, a physiologic concept um, that, that proning would improve your VQ matching and, and kind of offload your heart from your, um, from your lung parenchyma, which, you know, can, can lead to some increased recruitment. It changes your chest wall dynamics. So definitely kind of proved a physiologic point. 
Um, but that's a disease oriented outcome, you know, improving oxygen saturation. And, and we don't at this point have a, a, a good study that um, gives us a good patient centered outcome uh, showing that there's more people avoiding the ventilator or more people surviving. Um, the physician study was a, a neat study um, for me just because it was done in a rural hospital and I, I work in my community emergency medicine um, uh, appointment out in a community hospital about an hour outside of Winston-Salem here. And it's a very busy high hospital was, you know, pretty good acuity. And, but, you know, when you're in those environments, right, you don't have the, the resources of your, you know, your kind of major tertiary or quaternary medical centers have. And um, they looked at 105 patients and, and about 40% of those were able to tolerate proning. Um, they put them in the proning group if they could prone for at least an hour, five times per day and then at least once at night. And the people that couldn't prone that much or refused to prone were kind of placed into the supine group. Um, and then looking at the results, um, the, the prone group had uh, zero mortality, um, whereas the supine group um, approached 25%. Um, now there are a lot of caveats with the study because it was a retrospective study and the uh, supine group kind of self-selected for being sicker. Uh, so they had higher SOFA scores, higher Apache scores, uh, and they were about 10 years older. So all of those things are going to be prognostic for increased mortality. And when they tried to adjust some of these you know, changes that we're seeing or some of these differences that we're seeing started to kind of melt away. Um, but I think it, it still may be um, a signal that if your patient can prone, then they probably are going to do better. And if, if proning and, and high flow and those types of things help you avoid the ventilator. Um, then I think that's that's good for resource allocation and and um, you know trying to navigate this um, pandemic while doing the you know the most good for the most people um, and trying trying to avoid doing harm uh, as few as possible. Completely agree. And and as and I'm glad you mentioned the rural setting uh, because I think that's going to be an important. Uh, important uh, focus here moving forward for COVID-19 as we get into flu season anyway, but also with the increased volumes of you know, COVID-19, we're seeing straining of our tertiary and referral centers, a lot of divert status. I mean, I've seen several physicians talking about, you know, attempts to transfer patients for even non-COVID related issues and having significant di uh, difficulties, in, including one that said they had contacted 15 or 16 hospitals to try to get a transfer and couldn't make it happen. And I think that's going to be a bigger issue. And as you mentioned with the boarding status, I think that's going to become more of an issue um, for all of us uh, it, and, and maybe even potentially areas where they've never dealt with boarding before because of a combination of our traditional uh, winter related illnesses on top of the growing numbers of COVID-19. And so we're going to have to have solutions and opportunities and tools that we can use uh, in places where we may not have had to or been used to that type of situations in the past. Um, and so I think across the board, looking at our tools, the opportunities, the evidence that shows uh, the modalities that we can use, the safety of which they can be used, the risks and the concerns and um, the things that we need to do to help protect the patients, ourselves and our staff. Um, these are going to be big things moving forward because I think for the first time within the pandemic, we've had a lot, we've had hot spots, New York, uh, Washington being, uh, being the big ones uh, prior, but now basically across the entire country and especially in rural settings, we're seeing these huge numbers. And I think so it's going to be a, a important consideration and planning for a lot of the areas. And we have actually just repurposed two high flow devices down into our emergency department um, with the expectation of, of the numbers and changes. And honestly, because I've been pushing for it for uh, about two years now. Um, and so it's going to be, it's going to be big. And I think it's important information um, as we move forward and planners and medical directors and groups need to look at the opportunities and the things that you have and how you're going to deal with the remainder of uh, COVID-19. Because I think this last push hopefully going to be the last push is going to be the largest of the pushes um, moving into likely into through the winter and into spring of 2021. Uh, so talking here with Dr. Casey Bryant, um, how can folks get in touch with you if they have any questions, comments, thoughts, or need more information? Uh, well, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is hogtown underscore doc, uh, H-O-G-T-O-W-N underscore D-O-C. Uh, that's a, a shout out to where I grew up. Um, <laughs> It's an old name that's kind of stuck around to the to my hometown. Um, and then uh, you can certainly email me. Uh, it's C A S 
B-R-Y-A-N at wakehealth.edu. I'd be happy to take any questions or, or you know, have any type of dialogue you want to have. All right, Dr. Brian, I really appreciate it. And as for me, you can contact me at youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. That's youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com or at everydaymed on Twitter. I also invite you to subscribe to the podcast to make sure that you're downloading every week's episode. We've got some great content and we're continuing to bring out uh, the most up-to-date COVID uh, information that we can provide and we don't want you to miss any of it. And if you can share it with others, please do so. Uh, we're trying to grow the audience and get that information out there as we bring um, some of the best minds within medicine and emergency medicine uh, to your radio, headset, wireless device, phone, car, wherever that may be. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. <laughs>